Today in episode six, I relearn a valuable lesson, and that is being stubborn will get you nowhere. I also learned it takes a small army to handle a tub section, but in the end, I finally conquer the cowl section. And the other thing I want to do is I want to thank you guys for liking, smashing, hitting, subscribing, all those things that YouTube tells us to do. And in the end, it's really important. And what they've done is my impressions have gone up over 500% and over 2.5 million people were exposed to my videos. And about 6 more people watched. And what that means to you guys as the viewers, if we can make just a little bit of money doing this, I can hire an editor. And I have dozens of restorations and over 100 terabytes of film that I've filmed but I don't have time to edit it. So if we can get an editor, then I can get more content out to you. you can uh, enjoy all kinds of different videos, all kinds of different cars that we've done. And also, if you guys are a little bit like I am, I have multiple bad habits. Not only old cars, but um, airplanes too. I dug this Skybolt out of the container the other day, and it's looking pretty inviting for a restoration. So if that interests you, happy to bring you the airplanes too. Uh, just give me a comment down there in the section if you want to see airplanes. Oh, we've got them too. Well, you would think after 44 years of restoring cars, I'd finally get smart. But I didn't. I tried to do this thing the quick and easy way, which meant put this spoon behind this panel, try to beat it out straight. But this thing is a mess because this bracket really needed to go. But I was stubborn. I said, I can get this thing. I'll have this thing wrapped up in 30 minutes. Wrong. I think I wasted two hours, maybe three, chasing it around the bench, trying to hold the thing down. What an idiot. Well, as you can see, this thing got uh, really torn up when they tore the cow light off of it. So I tried everything to get up inside the bottom of it. It was cracking, it was falling apart, but nope, I was stubborn. I'm gonna fix this thing without having to blow this bracket out of here. This is actually painful to watch. I just go at it and go at it and go at it. I did manage to get it fairly straight, but when you think about it, you look at that bracket there, how in the world am I going to straighten that thing out without taking it off? You would think I would have realized that after uh, working on it for like 10 seconds, but no, I was stubborn. I said, I'm going to fix this thing without pulling this bracket off. What an idiot. And to compound my mistakes, this is something you never want to do. You don't want to get the metal so hot that you turn it blue, because what you've done is you stretch that metal in one spot. That's a real bad thing. Uh, it makes it real bitch. What I'm doing here is some off dolly hammering, trying to shrink it back down, because now I've got a bad spot. I've got a spot that's sort of taking off in the cowl down to the lower right. And I have to chase that, that high spot for a long ways. You can see the metal move back and forth, but no, I'm stubborn. I'm going to fix this thing. Well, I fixed it all right. I just screwed it up is all I did. See that cowl move back and forth? Yeah, it's just, it's just going all over on me. But... Too stupid to realize it. I just kept on going. So I can get this thing. But see that thing bounce back and forth? Well, I gotta get that oil can out of it. I'll eventually get it, but I sure made it hard on myself. And yes, finally I got smart. I blew the bracket out. I straightened it up. But look at all the shrinking and everything I had to do on that panel. That was totally unnecessary work. 
I could have just come in there and done it right in the first place, taken the bracket out, straightened out the area right around where the, the hole is for the cowlite, and then I could have had it just right. But no. See, I'm trying to get this line right here right and trying to get the shape right back underneath the belt molding there. So I've got a problem right through there is now I've got a, a wowie right there too. So I'm going to have to hammer all that out. So now I've got to put this piece back in and obviously I can't rivet behind the, the piece because I can't get to it. So they make these nifty little rivets that are threaded. So what I did is I put two of those in the back with threads on them and I'm a fumbling idiot that day. Some days you just got it and other days you don't. Well this was an I don't day. I kept dropping the parts and what a disaster. Anyways, there's the nut. I finally figure out how to coordinate this thing and get the nut behind there, but it's almost painful to watch this. All right, we'll hold that up there with a, a little uh, rivet at the front. And then I can handle putting the nut on the back side on this one. And the front, I had to do a little bit differently. I just wanted you guys to see this, to see what somebody is like when they just can't do anything right. How long it took me to just put a nut on a, on a screw. Well, about 10 minutes. Couldn't twist my fingers back behind there, so I had to go up from the other direction. So this is what it's like in the front. I drilled two holes that are bigger and that way I could stick the rivet through. Not another problem, I didn't want to put a big huge hole out there so that so I could get the air hammer in there and actually rivet that over. I really didn't need to do that. So what I did is I drilled out where they had spot welded it on there and I'm going to come in and just plug weld this and make it look like it was the spot weld. It's a good opportunity to get the MIG out. So that's held it in place. I've lined it up with the rivet. I've held it in place with that. I'll dress that off and it'll look just like a spot weld. Fine and dandy. The back side you'll never see, but I really wanted it to be accurate too. And it had one spot weld in it. So guess what? Same thing again. Plug weld that. So now on the front of this bracket, I'm going to go in and I'm going to melt that rivet right in there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill that hole back in and dress it off so you can't see it at all. And, uh, well, my not so cool cowl uh, bracket fix will be over with. So finally, after getting smart, I got everything straight, I got everything welded up, I got everything uh, looking like it's supposed to look on the outside, I've got the, the cowl nice and straight, I don't even have to lead that area, it is so, so nice, it's a little spot is all. But we still have to take care of that bracket for the radiator radius rod, it's a little helpful one of the guys in the shop here. 
we're gonna do it exactly like original. Now, this one's not a waffle pattern. This one is just a uh, rounded over rivet, so it's uh, much easier. Of course, if you jump off one of those waffle things, you just ruined it. You gotta blow it out and do it all over again. Well, I assembled the sub rails and all the sub wood. I painted it and I got it assembled onto the frame and set the cowl on there. Then I got together with a bunch of the guys and we picked this thing up and uh, we just manhandled it over here. The main reason why I had to have all those guys was is it was upside down so it's just a lot easier with all these people to whoop, just roll it over and then we'll lift it on there. We'll see how it fits. Well, we'll clamp it into place. We'll look like the city crew. Lots of standing around. Lots of looking at stuff. We'll figure it out, eventually. So surprisingly, the thing fit up pretty well. Remember I told you that the sills weren't exactly the same from side to side and they didn't know what to do with the shape at the bottom of the wheel well there. Well, it's no surprise that she's fighting me tooth and nail every step of the way. After all, they ripped the body off the frame with a forklift, tore all the mounts and everything else in the bottom of this body. Why should I be surprised that it ended up being racked to the right seven eighths of an inch at the top in this cowl section. The gas tank fit pretty well so I thought maybe where it broke here at the lower windshield pillar that just the windshield section was was racked over but come to find out the entire cowl was racked over so I had to change my pull points heat some sections up to get the metal to move easy and then I got it back into shape. Now why wouldn't have I put it on our Kansas Jack World Rack 4000 over there? It's a really neat machine. Well the reason why is, is I'm just working with the cowl and I've got to hold on to it somehow. And the only way for me to do that was to keep it attached to the frame. Might as well just do it on the scissor lift and push and pull with the cowl mounted to the frame. This morning I started by fitting the tub section on and the doors were way out and that's what first alerted me to this problem. So after uh, four, five, six hours. We have this thing back square. It's fitting nicely. The gas tank fits like it should. The windshield fit frame fits like it should. Now I can go back to what I started this with this morning, the tub section. Well, let me show you how I did it. The first thing I did is I hooked up all these tubes and hoses and everything else to make our poor little Model A look like it's a COVID patient. So what I had to do is I had to measure everything out. And yeah, we could take it over to the Kansas Jack World Rack. It has laser alignment, but it really doesn't work well for this. A good old fashioned tape measure works best. And what I found is that the whole cowl was racked to the right. So I wanted to heat where I needed it to move. So I would heat little spots here and there. Then I would just use a simple come along in the right spot and I would keep checking it, measuring it, and pulling on it. And so most of the time it was just a simple matter of uh, a come along strap, keeping the thing tied down to the scissor lift. They kept wanting to take off on me. Uh, but a little heat uh, here and there, that can really be your friend. And you can see down here in the bottom right there, I had to do uh, quite a bit of welding. I didn't cut that, it was broken. Uh, but you can see the amount of heat that I had to get in all of that bracketry to make it work. So it was just an odyssey of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know, getting the, the thing back in and checking it and checking it and retying it down. And, and it was just an arm wrestle all the way through. And then every once in a while I had to stop and check the windshield frame and make sure that the gap to the post was the same on both sides and it was sitting in there square and nice. Uh, so it, it was kind of an on and off, on and off, on and off thing. 
And when I have to put a axle strap around a sharp point, I always wrap it in leather first and then the axle strap doesn't get all cut up. I'd say it's been a, a good half a day getting this thing back in, in square and so everything fit right. You know, you have to wonder a little bit about the Ford engineers and placing a bomb in your lap in these Model A's. And that's what they did by putting the gas tank right here. But you know, in retrospect, in all the years that I've been working with Model A's, I don't think I've ever seen an incident where there was a problem with a ruptured tank and there was a big fire or anything. Yes, the fuel sender unit uh, could leak, almost never does. Yes, the brackets underneath, they do leak, that's a problem. Uh, sometimes the fuel line from the bottom of the tank out to the sediment bowl over here on the firewall will leak. So it's a, a minor problem taken care of quickly. It's not a big problem, but I've never even seen a car in a wreck where the fuel tank was a problem and blew up like I have seen where you have the 32 and newer Fords where the tank is in the back. So considering that the engineers were constrained by the three things, simple, rugged, and inexpensive, by placing the tank right here, Gravity works every single time. They eliminated the need for a lot of fuel line and a fuel pump. That worked in their favor. So I've got my cowl all squared up. I've done the lead work here on each corner that I had to do. And so that's all done. I've edged everything with paint and I've installed my uh, friction tape here on the firewall and underneath the windshield. So I think I'm ready to go with that and the tank I've done the same thing. I've edged it all with paint. I've soldered up all three spots underneath the tank. The uh, fuel drain spot, the choke rod spot, and the most important one is the steering column bracket. All that's done and I've pressure tested the tank so I know I'm in good shape. So uh, I've also gathered up the hardware for this and my brackets. I've got all my brackets painted up nice and I've got my uh, cowl welting from Roy Nesovich, beautiful stuff with a twisted cord. Uh, this thing is going to look exactly like original after it gets all painted up. And of course, the cheapest way to buy points in the Model A world, the correct hardware. So I've got all that here. So we're going to go ahead and let's mount this tank. Well, I've got to fix our wood header and here's the original. Very fortunate to have it. Here's where the windshield wiper shaft goes through the header. That's a metal piece. But unfortunately, the wood that we buy is not always very good. And uh, this is the case with the header. The header just wasn't the right width. It's not the right height. It doesn't fit the metal properly. Maybe they made several different Victoria dimension headers because they did make both a Murray and a Briggs bodied Victoria. So maybe they were different. But anyways, bottom line is, is that my header didn't fit. So I set up the table saw and I sawed it down initially to the right thickness. And then I had to make this chamfer in it right here, which is very important because it's got to fit the, the metal cap just right. So I got that all in and then I had to uh, go over and then just do some hand shaping. Uh, there's only so much I can do with the wood shop equipment and it's back to the old grinder. And this is a 9 inch grinder, a Makita grinder. I really like them. They're lightweight, variable speed. They work real well. But I get a brand new disc and I just kind of start working it down real sort of slow and keep checking the fit, checking the fit, checking the fit. Then once I've got the fit that's just right on the bench, then you got to go to the car. And it seems like there's always more modifications that have to be done. But that's doing woodwork in the old car world. It's that you have to make the wood fit the metal. You can see why I like a scissor lift. I can just raise and lower this thing to a nice comfortable height because there's so much back and forth, so much adjusting, making this little tweak, making that little adjustment, on and off, on and off. Can you imagine if you were in an uncomfortable position doing all this work? I don't think you'd ever get it done.
Well, finally, after about three hours of fitting, I got the uh, welder out and I started tacking the header back onto the windshield post. So we'll dress those all down, then we do the usual thing, let it up and finish it off. And this was the final result. We finally got the doggone thing fitted in, installed straight, and now with the cowl done, we can start fitting the tub up to the uh, door post there and all that. Our doors are finally fitting straight. Done. Next week, I get out the sill plates, start fitting the B pillar to the door, and uh, bring the tub section on. And we're going to get the tub section all on this thing, fitted up, welded, and all the rest of the wood in the body. So that's coming up on next time. See you next Friday.